So everybody, welcome back to the office. Uh, we're in Houston for a couple of weeks, going back to a hotbed of activity of coronavirus to El Paso, maybe in two or so. But uh, today there's uh, been some questions about Celsius and uh, they actually reached out and they said, hey, let's, whatever questions that you have, Rob and Digital Asset News, we would love to answer them. And thankfully, Alex Mashinsky, the CEO of Celsius came on here to answer the questions. And if you don't know, uh, Alex was the creator of Voice Over Internet Protocol, now more so for the Money Over Internet Protocol or MOIP. He's already gone through a couple of businesses, had some successful exits. And Alex, here you are today. Thanks for taking the time. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me back. Right on. So let's break into it, huh? Everybody's, everybody's busy. Let's see what we got. I'm going to share my screen real quick. Here's the different questions that we have brought to you by Digital Asset News and all the subscribers. So the questions are, first, we'll start with the ones that uh, we had come up with. There's five. Well, there's really four. How is yield created with Celsius? How is the Celsius token created and how does it hold value? Does Celsius ever invest in perpetual swaps and futures? Is the rehypothecation or rehypothecate in the terms and conditions for Celsius for lenders or borrowers collateral? And then we'll get to the others afterwards, but it's mostly the same types of things. So the first question we have, I think this is a, lot, a big question on anybody, everybody's mind is how is yield created with Celsius? And in all actuality, uh, Alex went over this in his last Celsius AMA. And what's great about the AMA is that they're all time stamped. So he talked about this in 1556, uh, how is yield created? And you can go from 1556 to 22, which I listened to. And it was a lot of answers but there was really no answers answers. And one of the things that you talked about was, hey, if you wanna know how yield is created in Celsius, go do a Google search for finance magnates uh, with, with Nico. And I Googled that and I saw this one. It's an hour and 11 minutes long. It's great information, Alex, but I didn't hear anything about how is yield actually created. I heard a lot of good structure and, and different uh, opinions about what uh, could eventually happen water flowing down from the banks and bypassing them and into Celsius. Good information, but the question still remains, how is yield created in Celsius? Yeah, so thanks for asking it again. And if it wasn't clear, I'm happy to clarify. The, the, um, in my MA, I was focused more on trying to explain to people that not all yield does, is the same, meaning that they really have to dig in. And like you are doing right now, ask very, very specific questions and, and let's, let's dive into it. So, uh, so we create yield in a very simple way, right? We uh, lend coins or dollars to institutions or individuals and they pay us interest, right? And the, we have to worry about uh, uh, them returning the asset, the underlying what we lent them and the interest that is accru accru accrued or accumulated uh, on the asset. So, the the interest is yield, right? So if we if I gave you a hundred dollars and I charge you ten dollars a year, that's a ten percent yield. And if I earned ten percent, I'm going to pay eight percent to the community. It's as simple as that. There's no there's nothing else complicated or like sophisticated computers doing algorithms or any of that stuff. It's very very simple. Uh, uh, it's hard to become an institution that borrows from Celsius. We reject over 50% of people that come to us and say, I want to borrow coins from you uh, because we think that those counterparties are too risky. And in most of the cases, they're just small hedge funds or small institutions who don't have a balance sheet. And we just feel that it's too risky to lend them coins. And the decisions we make every day are, uh, should I lend to some of the more to the some of the largest institutions of Wall Street who are my customers, or should I take a small customer instead? And the answer almost every day is I rather lend more to a billion dollar balance sheet company and take more risk with them than onboard a five million or ten million dollar hedge fund. So that's kind of half of the uh, equation. The other half is what we call margin lending. So if you give me uh, one Bitcoin and it's worth $18,000 and you want to borrow uh, uh, money from me, uh, I can lend you $9,000 or 50% LTV, right? And I'm, I'm still going to charge you 9% interest or 10% interest. And again, in this case, uh, I have an asset. I have a very liquid asset that I use as, as collateral. 
and you are a retail borrower. This is not institutional. This is retail borrowing where you can borrow dollars or stable coins against your main assets. Got it. So the answer is part of that. So let's backtrack for a second. So you talk about institutions. How many different institutions uh, do you actually work with? Now, I know you can't give me names, specifics, and things like that, but just in a general uh, terms of speaking, how many different types of institutions are out there that you actually lend to? And these are big institutions, I would assume, like you just talked about. Yeah, so, so we lend to <clears throat> over 350 institutions. These are all uh, onboarded, KYC, ML. And most of these people hold licenses, either with the SEC or the CFTC. And they're, almost all of them are onshore, meaning they're not sitting in the Bahamas or sitting in whatever. They're onshore entities that we work with, right? So we know uh, that they're regulated. We know that, they're, uh, that when they give us a financial statement, that it's real. Uh, and we do our own due diligence. I mean, we, we had uh, several attempts, for example, of people giving us fake information. We called the auditor, an Ernst & Young auditor, and he said, yeah, that's my signature, but I, ne- I never audited this company. So we, we, our level of due diligence goes all the way down to verifying the identity of the owners, verifying that they are really the legal owners of these companies, that when they sign an agreement, that means something. And verifying that uh, the information they give us, the financial statements, really represent uh, a true and real uh, status of those companies. So, um, and when you see hacks or when you see money being stolen, most of the time it's because uh, other people just don't take the time or the effort to go and dig deep. Uh, because again, our, our job number one is to return the coins. If we make one mistake, uh, obviously that that hurts our community. Right. So, okay, that makes sense. And then, so getting into institutional lending. So you've said this many times uh, over the course of years that it's all collateralized lending. So, and then I remember in the AMA, you said, if you can prove to me that anybody else has gotten a special sweetheart deal where there is no collateralization, then I will give you X amount of dollars. And so far you haven't had to put that in. So I don't, I mean, that only makes sense, right? To collateralize. So if someone wants $1,000 worth of X, you have to give up. $1,500 $1,500 worth of blah to get this type of asset back. And then they can do whatever they want with it. That is essentially how it all works. So there should be no instance where there every, anything would ever come up short. That's what I, as I see it. Is that right? Uh, no, that's not right. Because um, unless everybody gives you collateral uh, that is one-to-one, meaning if somebody gave me Bitcoin and I lent them Bitcoin, then there's zero risk. But because normally the two assets are not matching. Meaning if you borrowed Bitcoin and uh, you gave me dollars and Bitcoin doubled uh, and you don't return it, uh, my community has exposure, right? So it's so there's definitely a risk of default if I cannot collect additional collateral as the value of these coins moves very quickly. So like if you look at the last two months where Bitcoin went up 50, 60%, we had many margin calls to these institutions, right? And you would say, wait a second, these are famous big institutions. Why would you margin call them? Because their collateral was not sufficient to cover the loans they took, right? So we we don't care that you are famous and you have, uh, you know, like your your address is one Wall Street or whatever. We don't care about any of that stuff, right? All we care about is we have an agreement. You were supposed to give us 150% and now it's 120%. And you either return the coins or give us more collateral, right? Those are kind of like their relationship the way the relationship works. So the risk we're taking on behalf of the community is that some of these institutions will not perform on their margin calls, right? And and when you see a company blowing up or going out of, out of business, it's because they couldn't collect either the underlying or the additional collateral and basically the value of what they lent out uh, exceeded th- what they had in assets and basically they, they have to file for Chapter 11 or something like that. So as I mentioned on my AMAs, on every AMA, I state if we have any uh, bad debt, if we have any uh, defaults, if we have any uncollected asset. And to, to date, we, we've been in business now for three years. We haven't had any of such events, right? So so that goes back. I'm not saying there will be any. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure 100%, I can tell you right now, 100% certainty that there will be somebody that we lend to who will not pay us back. And that's why we committed to use our own balance sheet first 
to uh, pay back for any losses uh, before we go and tell our community, hey, we lost some money and so on. So, uh, and currently we have over $700 million worth of assets in our balance sheet. So, uh, you know, I, I laugh when I hear these people say, oh, I have insurance. Uh, cred had insurance. They can, they're not going to collect a dime from the insurance, right? So, so all I'm saying to your viewers is that you have to understand that sometimes people use words that don't, don't really mean anything and, and that you have to do your homework. And unless you have time to do your homework, uh, you shouldn't put your money uh, because you're putting it at risk. So we try to make it as, as clear and as simple as possible. But I agree with you. Sometimes these words and these sentences get to be too long and people look at this and say, I don't understand. And uh, either I'm not taking risk or I'm taking a little bit of risk. Uh, and and that's that's where we end up, right? So let's let's simplify it everything, right? Let's take institution A comes to Alex, comes to Celsius, and says, "Hey, I want to borrow Bitcoin. Okay, I want to have ten Bitcoin. So what do they have to give you to get ten Bitcoin?" So if you're, uh, I would say, less than a fifty million dollar bal balance sheet company, probably mm -hmm. we'll ask you for between one hundred fifty and two hundred percent collateral. Okay, okay? so. So collateral uh, being, being exactly what? So what kind of? So if you borrow in Bitcoin, uh, this would be either cash collateral or a okay. different asset like Ethereum, for example. So I prefer to take Ethereum because Ethereum moves mostly in the same direction as Bitcoin or other assets. So, so because of that, I have less of a chance that uh, you will get a margin call because there's a high chance that they both are going to move in the same direction at the same time. Uh, but if somebody wants to give me cash, that's fine. We'll take the cash. And uh, basically, if you don't uh, uh, respond to the margin call, I immediately go and buy Bitcoin with the cash you gave me. And I try to cover as much of that position as possible. And if you return the coins, great. I'll return the cash to you at that time. So, yeah. Gotcha. So, so it sounds like to me, it's so like a lot of these institutions are coming to you and it doesn't sound like it's all cash. It sounds like it's Ethereum for Bitcoin or um, XRP for Matic or something like that. Is that what's going on? Yeah. So, so if if it's an asset that's volatile, like cause XRP is obviously much more volatile than uh, Bitcoin is. Okay. Uh, then I may require two hundred and fifty percent instead of one hundred and fifty percent. So, so each each uh, asset has its own volatility ranking, mm -hmm. and obviously dollar being the least volatile and and. Uh, uh, we don't accept any of the shit coins, right? So you can't come to me and say, I'm giving you uh, whatever, some coin that barely trades, right? We don't, we're not going to take it. So I would say we take probably the top five coins uh, uh, as collateral. And uh, obviously, if you want to give me USDT or USDC, all those things are, are, are acceptable. Uh, but uh, again, we, we say no to trades every day. So uh, mm -hmm. again, I would say we fill maybe 50 to 70 percent of trade requests uh that we get okay thanks so here's another question that i have and that's so these, so these institutions are swapping things out and they want bitcoin or they want whatever they want right so let's say let's just take bitcoin so it's the easiest one right now i think you're getting around four and a half to five and a half percent interest on celsius somewhere around there so let's say you make seven or let's just make just one point above so that's great. So Celsius has to make money. That's fine, right? It goes the other other part goes back there. Uh, the institution has to pay a little bit more. So when they take that Bitcoin, they give a bunch of Ethereum up. Bitcoin comes back to these institutions. What exactly are these institutions doing with the Bitcoin that would uh, make them or want them to pay a higher interest rate than anything else? Now I know institutions cannot they cannot custody uh, cryptocurrency. There is, there is laws against it. SEC might change that. OCC has talked about it, but here we are. So real quick. Walk yeah, they, 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 I agree with you. They cannot make money just putting it in custody, right? So, so that, that's not a business, right? You, paying 7 or 8% and then not doing anything with it. So the only reason an institution would borrow it is because they see an opportunity to make money, right? And they don't want to take the directional risk of Bitcoin going up or down, meaning if they use their cash to buy the Bitcoin and Bitcoin drops 10% that day, they lost 10%. But if they gave us cash, borrowed Bitcoin, 
Bitcoin dropped and they returned the Bitcoin, they still got all the cash they gave us. Oh, yeah. I mean, right? that makes, so, yeah, for me, sorry to interrupt, but for me, the cash makes sense, right? The cash goes right. in, Bitcoin goes up 25%. Like, exactly. well, I so only paid eight, so I'm good. But if they're going to stay in the Bitcoin, it's kind of weird. Right. So, so again, if they're long, if I agree with you, if they're long Ethereum, meaning they're already holding it, that is a, a different scenario than if they gave us cash, right? So, so let's talk about both of them uh, separately. So let's talk about the cash first. Uh, and uh, basically, there's really only three activities, main activities that these uh, hedge funds and institutions do. I know, I know everybody keeps it really secretive and it's like hush hush, but I can tell you that there's oh, nothing is. special, nothing special to it. They either do shorting, which is a business that we don't really believe in and we think it's very risky. And shorting uh, means I believe that XRP is going down. And I am going to borrow the XRP from Celsius and give them some kind of collateral. And I'm going to sell it on an exchange, wait a little bit, and then buy it at a lower price. Why? Because I know there's some news coming out or I know that uh, somebody's about to dump a lot of it. Or I know that, for example, the XRP Foundation is needs to sell some coins and I'm going to sell them ahead of the foundation, right? So just, again, hypothetical. These are all hypothetical of course, examples. Of course, yeah. Right? So, so and I'm not picking on XRP uh, specifically. <laughs> I'm just uh, explaining to people what are the examples, right? So shorting is definitely uh, a good business. There are few people in the world who are exceptional in it. But uh, on average... It's a very, very risky and very, very bad game because if you're wrong, you can get uh, your face ripped off because uh, anyone who shorted Bitcoin at 9,000 and 10,000 and 11,000 got liquidated, right? So, several times over. So, so you may be right, uh, but the market will <laughs> prove you wrong, right? So, so it doesn't matter what you think, right? And what your, th what your direction is. So we, we, in writing, we ask almost every one of our counterparties, are you shorting, right? And if if their strategies are more than 20% short, meaning whatever we lend them, at least 20% of that is uh, used for shorting, we, we normally would not lend to that institution, right? So because we see that as a very risky strategy for us, right? For the chances of us getting the coins back. So let's talk about the other two strategies. Okay. Well, real quick, the, what, what you said about, the, you know, like we're going to ask them, they're going to short, they're like, we're not going to short. No, you know, but you, yeah, but look, yeah. they have to put it in writing. So, so if you are a regulated uh, uh, institution, uh, uh, putting it in writing and and lying about it is is actually a pretty big problem with the SEC. It's not a uh, it's not a little offense, right? So, because you have to you have mm -hmm. to state in your charter when you tell the SEC what you do, you have to state in your charter uh, mm -hmm. what kind of activities you perform, including the uh, CFTC and so on. So. So if you're not doing shorting, you cannot just start doing shorting the next day, right? So sure. things like that. So, so can somebody lie to us? Of course, but of course. Uh, I think most of these people are, are you know, if they need the coins for shorting, they'll just go and borrow them from somebody else, not from Celsius. You okay. know. So sorry uh, to interrupt you. Now talk about the other two things before yes. I rudely interrupt you. I'm sorry. No, no problem. Mm -hmm. So the other strategy which we actually like is market making, and market making means that uh, orders. Buy orders and sell orders don't come to market at the same time, and meaning there could be a huge buyer coming in, but it came five minutes after a huge seller finished selling, right? So, so who fills that void, right? Who actually fills and is always there to make sure that all the buyers and all the sellers can match their orders, right? And that's what market makers do. And market makers effectively look at statistical volumes, look at directional volumes and things like that. And they know when they can buy and when they can sell. But again, market makers don't want to take directional risk. They don't want to own the Bitcoin in case it drops or in case it even goes up by a lot, right? Because they don't know which direction the coins are going. So they much rather borrow the asset, do market making. And uh, uh, what, what we charge them for a year, they usually make in a month. So when you say, who's going to pay mm. you 7 or 8%, uh, when you look at uh, Jump Trading or Cumberland or all these giant companies that are, that represent 20, 30 percent each, 20 or 30 percent of all the volume on the New York Stock Exchange or the Nasdaq, uh, they make all their money market making, right? It's called HFT, high frequency trading, and and uh, basically they know 
uh, how to create value just from the fact that buyers and sellers don't show up at the same time. So the same thing exists in Bitcoin, Ethereum, and so on. And we lend uh, a lot of coins to these market makers, which is a great low-risk strategy because, again, they're not betting in, in any direction. Right. They're just filling orders. And, and the third, third strategy, which is, again, very simple, every one of us can do it, is arbitrage. What does it mean? Arbitrage, uh, Bitcoin is traded on over 300 exchanges. And at every moment of the day, there is at least a 2 or 3% gap between U.S. exchanges and Asian exchanges and European exchanges. So if you had coins in all the right places, you could buy on Binance, for example, and sell on Coinbase and lock in 1% gain in a second, right? And it, imagine doing that 10, 20, 30 times a day, right? So, so again, if you're a big enough institution, you can park $10 million worth of coins on a bunch of different exchanges, wait for the price to vary, and in a day, you can make what we, right? We, we charge you 8% a year or 9% a year. If you did one transaction, like I said, once a month, you would be ahead of the game. And they do once a day, not once a month. So, gotcha. so the, the point is, is that those are normal strategies. Nothing that I described to you, including lending coins, which is called SEC lending on Wall Street. Mm -hmm. You can go to Google and look up SEC lending. We do exactly the same thing. But instead of lending securities, we lend coins. So none of these practices are practices that are unique or proprietary to crypto. They're, we actually copied all of it from Wall Street. And if you do a search about SEC lending on Wall Street, on your Google search bar, you will not find a single institution in 100 years that ever went out of business because of SEC lending. They went out of business because of real estate loan and because of uh, you know, CDOs and, and CLOs and all this other stuff, but not SEC lending. SEC lending is considered one of the safest businesses on Wall Street. And what, what Celsius created was bringing the SEC lending business into crypto and giving the community 80% of that value, uh, which no one does. On Wall Street, Fidelity or Interactive Brokers or even Robinhood, does not, they make hundreds of millions of dollars lending your Tesla stock, lending your Facebook, Landing your Apple stock, you get none of it. So the big change, the big innovation about Celsius is that we decided to give 80% of that to the community. Gotcha. So out of these ones, so thanks for clarifying. Out of these ones that we just talked about, the three that you talked about, market makers and arbitrage, uh, which one is like the highest percentage that you guys do over at Celsius? Is it equal amongst those three? Or is it kind of like, well, we see a lot of... Uh, you know, market makers or arbitrage? Yeah, so I, I would say it's it's probably 60% uh, 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 market making, 30% uh, 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 arbitrage, and maybe 10% uh, sh directional. Short, it doesn't mean uh, mm -hmm. only shorting. Like sometimes people borrow things to go long, right? So sometimes, like right, right now, today, everybody wants to borrow dollars because they want to go long on Bitcoin. <laughs> they mm -hmm. use the dollars or USDT to buy Bitcoin, but that is a directional bet, right? For us, it's a risky bet. It's, it's, it's not a, a non-risky bet. Yeah, people like to talk about doing these things. I'm not really keen on it, but that's just me because I'm not a big gambler. But that's exactly. just how it works. Okay. It, it, I, and I, 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 I salute you on it because I think Bitcoin is such a volatile asset that you don't need leverage on it to become successful. Because if you do take leverage and it goes in the wrong direction, you, can, you stand to lose everything. But if you don't have leverage, no one will take your coins away from you. Well, Alex, you can't, you, can't make, you can't become a millionaire overnight without leverage. Don't you know? That's how it works. Of course, that's, that is sarcasm. C cells, look, the Celsius community is a perfect example of what I'm talking about, right? We have, we've created 64 millionaires uh, who just bought sell token without leverage, to your point, right? And, and uh, just look at our top 200s. They're all listed on our website and how much sell token they hold. And many of these people bought it at three and four cents uh, when, uh, you know, when we were just preaching people, teaching people about what is the flywheel, how does it work, where does the income come from? And I think one of your next question is, uh, is talking about that. So let me answer will, it directly. Thank you. That leads me to my next question. Like you just said, how is the Celsius token created and how does it hold value? Because I think we're looking at a max supply of 699, 698 million. Is that right? 695 million. Yes. Okay. So, so how so is we, that created? How does it hold value? Yeah. So uh, the word limited supply is used uh, by many, many people 
in very, very different ways. For example, not to pick on XRP, but I have to use them again. XRP has limited supply, but mm -hmm. that limited supply is something like 100 billion. Or it's just a crazy number, right? So, right. So, so when you have limited supply, but it's, you know, every person on the planet can have 10, 10 of those coins or 100 of those coins, then it doesn't really mean much. So limited supply for us means scarcity. And Bitcoin has scarcity. It's 21 million uh, coins in total. Uh, Celsius is scarcity, 695 million uh, uh, tokens ever going to be created. They're already created. They're already minted. We don't have mining, so there's no way to create more and more tokens. And these were all created in the ICO. They're all listed on our website. You can see exactly what each token is allocated to. Again, half of these are held by Celsius. Celsius has not sold a single token uh, from its treasury since we were created, right? So we... We are a buyer of token. We're not a seller of token. Every week, we have to pay interest. We go to market, and we are the largest buyer, still the largest buyer of sell token on Liquid and on other exchanges. So in circulation right now, how much is in circulation? 285, 300 million? Yeah, so, so basically, besides the tokens that are held by Celsius, right. there are other things that are locked up. They're either locked up for partners or they're locked up for, for other purposes. And uh, if you go on uh, uh, Liquid or if you go on uh, CoinGecko or anywhere else, you can see exactly how much is in circulation. I think it's either 275 million or 285 or something like that. So whatever, whatever the uh, circulating supply is, is listed on the, on the different uh, uh, coin market. I, I, there is a little gap. Like I, I like CoinGecko, I think, is the most accurate coin market cap, does not have an accurate number because. For some reason, coin market cap does not include coins that are listed, uh, uh, that are held by our users inside Celsius, meaning right. the people that are earning interest inside Celsius, which makes no sense. So just use the CoinGecko number. Yeah, so CoinGecko, I just pulled it up. Circulating supply, 379 million, roughly. And then the yep. total supply is 695 million. So the 379 yeah, so was all from the interest paid to users who said, okay, I'm going to take this and I'm going to sell it off. Because the ones that are locked up, those are locked up for the developers, for Celsius, for I think you had something for the employees as well. Yeah, so we so to to correct that, that we we obviously had an ICO and we sold some tokens to the ICO. There's still many many people who hold these tokens since the ICO. Mm -hmm. uh, we we publish every week how many tokens we bought. So I think uh, again I, I'm doing it from memory. I don't have it in front of me, but it's something like 46 million tokens. Uh, is the total number that we bought from the market and gave to our community as interest. Gotcha. So it's definitely it's definitely not the majority of that 370 something million. So yeah. the majority of that is either ICO or uh, tokens that were mm -hmm. like recently, for example, we gave the employees a bo one time bonus, which was uh, 25 million tokens. They, it's locked up for three years, but it's right. already in their wallets, right? So. So there's all these things are broken up on our website. If you go to sell token on the Celsius.network website, you can see all the wallets, you can click on them, you can see what the activity is, and you can track all the stuff. All of that is fully transparent. And again, the key is that there's limited supply. We're not going to make any more of it. And every week we go to market and buy more and more of that token. So we're talking about, so the next part was how does it hold value? That's one of those things that you just said. However, like when we talk about the yield that is actually uh, accrued from somebody who, not in America, but let, let's say in, in Europe, I believe, they can put in Bitcoin, they can put in Ethereum, they get a percentage, they can be paid in Celsius. Those tokens get taken from, from Celsius, go right to those people. And that's where it sounds like it holds value. So the original amount, the 695 million that you had, some went to IC, a lot went to ICO, other went to people. That's where it holds value when you pay it out to those people, and they can do whatever they want to. Is that what is that correct or incorrect? It, so yeah, there's several ways that uh, uh, value is created. So first, the um, we basically um, when we sold these tokens, right? The the there is a market out there, right? So every day uh, there are buyers and sellers that show up to the market, and they really decide what the price is. We don't decide what the price. It's not like we go and say it's uh, $7 sure. or it's $5 or it's 50 cents. So if there are more sellers than buyers, the prices will go down. And if there's more buyers than sellers, the prices will go up. 
in, in mathematical terms, we are very similar to what BNB does, right? For, so if you're familiar with the Binance BNB token, mm -hmm. basically Binance takes a portion of their earnings and goes to market, buys those tokens and burns them. We don't burn them. We just buy the token and pay them as interest. So it's very similar, but the end use is a little bit different. Now, the, the, the people that hold those tokens hold them for two reasons. One is they believe that and they want to basically earn the 5% interest, right? They want to earn, the, the, which is the yield on the sell token if you deposit it with Celsius. Right. And the second piece is they, they're earning more interest. So that 4.5%, for example, on Bitcoin turns into a 6.2% if you have at least 25% of your assets in sell token in your wallet. So that's a utility that you get, just like you get miles from... American Airlines, or just sure. like you get uh, whatever points from American Express, right? So, so there are multiple utilities, and because people retain them or hold them, there are that causes it to have less sellers and more buyers, right? So less sellers, more buyers, the sure. price goes up. Supply so, demand, exactly. So, so our job at Celsius is to guarantee that we have more users, more deposits. More deposits means more loans. More loans means more interest. And if we have more interest being paid to us, then we have to go and pay that interest out to our community. We have to take 80% of that and pay to our community. Now, half of our community said to us, don't pay me Bitcoin on Bitcoin. Don't pay me XRP on XRP. I want it in sell token. And I want my 30% bonus. So every week, and we publish those numbers. If anyone can go on our Twitter account or YouTube or whatever and see exactly how many uh, we have a graph that shows you exactly or go to celsiushub.com that's an independent group that is auditing us every day and you can see exactly how or celsius.com there's many many sites that track this every day so but the point is is that every week as we earn more and now we have uh, 2.6 billion in assets right so it's like huge numbers uh, uh, basically we have to buy more and more and more coins. And when you buy more and more coins, there are more buyers and sellers. So, so it's just a natural flywheel, which is described very clearly in, uh, on this website. Again, not our site. We don't, they pull all the data from the blockchain and they do their own math. And again, you can contact the people who run those sites and ask them questions and, and validate or, or invalidate what they're telling you. Okay, got it. All right, thanks. Next one. Let's move along, shall we? Does uh, Celsius ever invest in perpetual swaps and futures? Yeah, so I saw several articles claiming that we do that stuff. We don't have any positions in options or futures or swaps or anything like that. That's not our business, right? So if, if we do that, that right. would be taking great big risk on your behalf. And that's not what our business is to earn the highest yield, but take the lowest risk. Right. I never understood some businesses, they have a great model. And then for some reason, they try to make more and more and more. I'm like, just stick to the model. Don't be don't exactly. go crazy. Just make it and have, make sure your customers are delighted, like Warren Buffett says, and everything works itself out. I never understood that. But the, I guess it is the human element. Okay. And the next one, coming on the last ones, rehypothecation. Re is the rehypothecate in the terms and condition for lenders or borrowers collateral? Lenders, you know, rehypothecate, sure. But the borrower, so borrower comes to you, here's my Ethereum, here's 150% of it, you're going to hold it in there. Do you do anything else with that that they give to you? Do you lend that part out? Yeah, so, so the word rehypothecate just means lending, right? So, right? so just a sophisticated word that, that most people can't even pronounce. But yeah, exactly. the answer is, the, <laughs> it's just lending. So the question is, do you lend the collateral that you get from me as a borrower? And the answer is yes. For us, we have a pool of BTC, we have a pool of ETH, right? So we don't look at uh, your ETH as just some ETH that's sitting in some bucket. It's being added to the pool, and we look at the entire pool and we say, okay, here's a pool of ETH. We have, let's say, whatever, 200,000 ETH right now in deposit. Let's put 10% of that in case somebody wants to withdraw it, and the rest of it we try to lend as much as we can. We don't care if it came from... A borrower, it came from a depositor, or it came from collateral. Actually, the pool is made out of those three components. Borrower, depositor, and who? And collateral. Okay, so just to clarify, Rob comes in. Rob, Pete, and Jerry, they've all got 100,000 Ethereum. 
you now have 300,000 Ethereum. You give that away. Institution comes in and says, hey, I want 300,000 Ethereum. Sure, give us 450,000. They give that to you. Now you have, so that 300 goes away. The 450 that is there for collateral, does that just stay there or do you all lend that out? As we, well? we lend that out as well, yes. So, okay. so, so again, we, we, banks have what's called fractional reserves. We don't do right. fractional reserve. That's right. illegal for us. We're not a bank. Uh, but we are allowed to rehypothecate or lend out the collateral. So the only place in the in the model where we have any leverage is through rehypothecation of the collateral, lending the collateral. So that is where we make uh, money. When you ask yourself, well, how come if Celsius gives 80% of the value back to the community, where is it making money? One of the places where we make money is the collateral because we don't pay interest on the collateral. Gotcha. So... The collateral, the collateral that's there, you say, look, we got to loan that out. Let's say something happens, Black Thursday, like it happened in March again. And for some reason, overextended here, especially for the, the collateral that's been put in. What happens then? Margin or Things get called back? Can you say, hey, yeah, you got to so pay Mar- March, March 12 is exactly the, was a test for everybody in this industry. And we've seen record liquidations i think uh, bitmex liquidated over a billion dollars in a few hours you've seen uh maker dow uh, liquidate 270 million dollars in a few hours right costing people 16 percent in in fees uh for that liquidation celsius had zero liquidation zero not a single liquidation right so so the reason for that is that again for us uh, you either return the coins or you give us more collateral so for us, there is no, uh, we match the book at all times, right? So we always have just enough on all sides to make sure that we have zero net exposure. We ourselves are never long Bitcoin or Ethereum or anything else. And when we don't have enough of something, then we ask everybody to give us that as cloud. So if we don't have enough cash, we ask for cash as cloud. We don't have enough ETH, we ask for ETH as cloud to balance the books. In March 12, we had over 600 margin calls. Uh, not a single liquidation. All the institutions uh, brought us or, or paid what they had to pay. And uh, like I said on the, on my AMA, we walked out of it uh, smelling like a rose. And obviously that was not the case for many of our uh, competitors. That is true. I remember the story. Yeah, it was, uh, I think, what did you say, like three or four actually got liquidated as opposed to the BitMEX? But uh, that is what it is. Yeah, in total, since since uh, March seven retail liquidations. So these are retail users. Maybe uh, they borrowed a thousand dollars or five thousand dollars. Not not one of them was, I think, more than fifteen thousand dollars. And they are people who said to us, "Look, just keep some of my coins, right?" So they're not. They didn't even close the loan. They just said, "Keep some of my coins," but zero institutional liquidations. Gotcha. Okay. So here's the questions from the people. I'm not going to keep you forever because there's a lot of there's a lot of redundancy because we go over every one. You're never going to get uh, back to Celsius. So let's just let's just sum it up like this. The big thing I heard about was insurance. So tell us about insurance because there's two types of insurance. There's something that happens in the hot wallet, and there's also the insurance when you loan it out, which is the collateral that we talked about. So this yep. is this is what I have on my exchange and wallet fees, which I always list you guys. I always talk about it, but as far as insurance. Crypto at Celsius is insured. So there is a link I send everybody to. And it says here, Fireblocks and Prime Trust. Our custodians both provide insurance on assets. However, we generate interest rewards by lending out the assets to onboard partners. When these assets are lent out, they are not insured, which we talked about already. That's the whole thing with the collateral, making sure it's there. So the question then is, for insurance, in the beginning, we talked about cred and their model that just was not good at all. They had insurance. Insurance is not going to touch them. So for insurance here for the hot wallet, how does that work? How much is it? Because like with the FDIC, it's two hundred fifty thousand dollars, right? Yeah. For here in the situation, how does that work here at Celsius? Yeah. So so uh, Fireblocks. Uh, I should update that site. Uh, Fireblocks insurance is thirty million dollars uh, for the hot wallet, right? So if for if, everything, yeah. For everything, right? So if money moves uh, inside that wallet and at that moment uh, a hacker or somebody jumps in and grabs it, the insurance company will pay up to $30 million, right? So so it covers the transition of the assets between our facilities or our cold storage and the customer or where the customer is, right? So 
Uh, and again, when, when you see other companies claim that they have 200 million insurance or 100 million insurance, those are only for cold wallet storage, right? So as long as, right. as, long as it's sitting in Gemini, uh, BlockFi has $100 million insurance. But if it lent it to an institution like we do, right. they don't have any insurance on it. So, so just understand that it's not, it's not that we have insurance and they don't or the other way around. Uh, I think Celsius is the only company that has hot wallet insurance and we don't have cold wallet insurance because it doesn't mean anything. For, at any moment, all of our assets are lent out. So why insure an empty wallet? Right. You know, okay. so, <laughs> so, and we state clearly on the side that when it's lent out, there is no insurance, right? You're relying on Celsius judgment uh, to make sure that we lent it to an institution that's going to return it. And as we stated several times, if something goes bad, we're going to go to our own pocket first. Look, I personally, I have over $100 million personally in the Celsius wallet sitting next to, if you have money with us, it's sitting next to your money. If you have BTC, it's sitting right next to my BTC. You have USDC, it's sitting right next to my USDC. So, so if, if, if we suffer a loss, I suffer the same loss pro rata with you, right? So, so I'm protecting myself just as much as I'm protecting you. And I, and I built Celsius for myself. It just happens that 230,000 people now use it as well. You know, so, so I'm, I'm, not, I'm not on the other side of the trade, right? You, you can call uh, Zach from BlockFi and ask him how much money does he have at BlockFi, right? He's not going to tell you $100 million, right? So, or more. So I, I'm not bragging about the money. I'm just telling you that if, I, if something happens to Celsius, that is a substantial loss for me. I can't just... What, you know, wipe it and, and keep walking, right? So, so we take this stuff very seriously. And, and, uh, and because of that, uh, everything we put together, if you look at it and read it carefully, you will see that it is acting in your best interest. Right, gotcha. And for the most part, like, like we, we talked about before, you know, it's not about, it's, there's a scam here, there's a scam there, whatever else. It, that's not how it is. It's just bad business. Bad business practices is what get, gets people in, uh, in real big trouble. It's not that people are, are purely evil or purely good. It's just one of those things. So sure, that makes make total sense. So the last thing- Well, you have to, you have to worry about the scams and the bad business. <laughs> it's, two, yeah. it's two things you have to worry about, yes. Yeah, we try to get rid of as many scams here as we possibly can because there are so many out there. And uh, I mean, in 2021, when a lot of the baby boomers are going to come in, which they are, what are they going to do? They're going to fall for these scams. Okay, Alex, this is the last one. And we're going to get to the DNS propagation like we had talked about. And then we'll finish up and I'll get you out of here back to yep. dinner with your lovely wife. So the DNS propagation happens last week, correct? Yes, there was there was a transfer over from from your website and your app, uh, and there was going to be some upgrades or something that you guys were going to do. So you contacted GoDaddy and said, "Hey, we need to update this." Sure, there's going to be a DNS propagation, and the site went down for 36 hours, something like that. Although I will say this, YouTube also went down, and a lot of other uh, uh, websites did go down. So I know from experience because I've done this myself on my websites. Uh, when I call GoDaddy, because I use GoDaddy too. Uh -huh. And uh, I say, uh, hey, I need to upgrade. Sure, it's going to be a DNS propagation. How long is it going to last? They'll tell me it's going to be between 24 to 72 hours. Make sure you tell your people because it will be down. So I told them seven days, five days, three, two, one, day of, 24 hours. And when it came back up, which was actually 36 hours. So bring us through that whole thing with as many as little details as you get. Yeah. So thanks for the opportunity. And, and, uh, there's no question that we should have uh, announced the maintenance window earlier, that we should have communicated the possibility that there will be propagation. We didn't even think there was propagation, but uh, uh, there was, uh, again, these are actions that actually GoDaddy took, not that we took, that caused the propagation. And because GoDaddy detected some things internally that are related to them, not to us, they decided to lock down the account. Right. So they locked down our account. We didn't lock down our account. And when we reached out to them, normally, like, as you know, you, when you reach out to them, they, re, they go back to you in an hour and so on. But something happened inside GoDaddy. And that's why Uniswap was down and Liquid was down and a bunch of other sites were down. And, and so it's not just something that happened to Celsius, right? It happens that Celsius did maintenance on the DNS exactly at the same time. Mm. But something else was going on inside GoDaddy and we're waiting for them to tell us what and how and so on. But 
there is a big difference between us and uh, Liquid and Uniswap and others. And the, the difference is that there is nothing you can do on the Celsius site. You cannot put your password. You cannot withdraw coins. You cannot transact. You do, you can't do anything there, right? It's just an informational site, and everything that happens happens on the blockchain and on our app, which are completely separated and segregated from our website. So because of that, everybody who's watching this can be assured that none of their information was compromised, right? So again, if you look at the point where BlockFi was compromised, right, where everybody with where the hackers stole all of their passwords and all the names and all of the balances that people had, uh, which is what was reported in Cointelegraph and Coindesk and so on. Uh, that was because that site accepted all that information and the hacker managed to get it through, right? So, mm -hmm. so th there was definitely an event here. Uh, uh, we should have uh, informed people better. And uh, the, the site was shut down because GoDaddy wanted to make sure that there was no hack, there was no penetration, there was no illicit activity. Uh, but there was definitely a brute force attempt uh, on the Celsius.network site, meaning somebody tried to break the password, go down and shut it down because they had other things happening with other sites. And, and as you saw, Liquid had a problem and so on. Uh, they had a major problem, right? Celsius was, didn't have any problem because, again, there was nothing to steal. So that's the kind of like the, the quick versions. And we're still waiting for that report. And I hope to publicize it the minute we get it. Unless Godaddy tells us you're not allowed to, <laughs> we will uh, publicize the report. Well, I will just say this. Uh, some other places may be a little bit more quick to rush to appease the uh, users. So I'm glad that you kept it locked down for that amount of time. I've already had my data breach in other different places, uh, Equifax being one of those places. So uh, thanks for uh, not making those huge uh, mistakes. So again, Alex, thanks for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. And I will just say this, that there are two things that I always uh, liked from not just your company. I like your company. I like you. And I actually believe in you, what you're talking about. But when you say you must first do good, then do well. That's a great saying. I think it's, it's good for everybody. And there's another thing you talk about as far as like life. There should be something that you uh, look forward to. There should have goals and someone to love. And those three things are pretty much a secret to life. So those two things, uh, I appreciate uh, the wisdom that you pass on. So again, thanks for coming to the show. Really appreciate it. Anything else we should know? Or is that uh, we cover everything? We took, I think we had like an hour. Someone yeah. to love, something to do, and something to look forward to. Yes, those are the yeah. three. You got those three. You, don't, you shouldn't be worried about <laughs> anything else. Uh, look, I, I, I wish everybody health. I mean, this is a very difficult time for everybody, especially like you in Houston. It's being hit pretty hot, pretty badly. Uh, and uh, hopefully, we next time we meet, we'll be talking about uh, you know all the great things that are going on instead of worrying about our health and <laughs> and 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 the things that uh, you know all all of the things we just talked about are completely uh, irrelevant in the context of uh, keeping your health and. And, uh, you know, and your family and everything else. Very true. Without health and family, what do you have? Absolutely nothing. All right. Alex, thanks. I appreciate it. And uh, I'll see you on the next one. Thanks for having me.